All right. We have attendees coming in. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first day of the sessions of uh, the Minnesota GIS LIS Consortium um, Conference. Uh, I'm Jerry Goodwin. I am going to be the student moderator today. I'm from St. Mary's University down in Winona. Uh, we have with us today Carl Reim of Hennepin County, and we have Matthew St. Ores and Savannah Grunsky of uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, they will be presenting to us today uh, transportation. I'm going to step to the side and let them take the show. Carl, you've got the floor. All right. Um, cool. So I believe uh, you can all see my screen now. It doesn't look like I can uh, show my video. Maybe that's okay. Um, All right, I believe, uh, hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, so my name is Carl Ryan. Um, I'm from, as Jerry mentioned, I'm from Edmond County. I work in public works, the county. Uh, specifically, I'm in the transportation planning division there. Um, and we work all, quite a bit with uh, crash data. Um, so we're kind of the, division that is responsible for um, collecting and analyzing and kind of distributing crash data internally to the rest of our partners. Uh, so over the last, um, I suppose, year or so, we've been really building up kind of a new crash analysis system, uh, one that is GIS-based, which is exactly why uh, we're presenting it at this conference. Um, so, uh, without further ado, and I guess a little bit about me too is, you know, my title is a planning analyst, but about 90% of my work is GIS based, uh, which is where I like it. Um, so that just provides a, a great opportunity for me to really dive into something that I think is important to the county and to our, our community uh, and something that's, you know, I really enjoy kind of taking all this data in and doing something fun with it. So, so starting out uh, just with a crash data overview. Uh, so what happens when you get into a, a car crash? You know, ideally you get out to exchange information with um, the other driver if there is another driver. Also, very ideally, uh, you would call a, a police officer to come out and do uh, a, a report on the crash. And so when the police officer fills out this report, he's collecting really uh, helpful information, at least in our industry, very helpful information like um, very basic uh, GPS coordinates, um, the type of crash that's occurring, um, the date, time, uh, severity of the crash, uh, any contributing factors like alcohol or distracted drivers. Um, and then usually a, a brief narrative about what occurred or what, uh, what maneuvers happened that led to the crash. Um, and so this information then uh, is hosted by the, in Minnesota, it's hosted by the Department of Public Safety. Um, and from there, it can be distributed to uh, government transportation departments, as well as consultants, if they're looking to, to analyze the data as well. Um, so specific to Henton County, how, no, why do we need the data? What are we looking to get out of it? Um, so for quite a long time, Henton County has been kind of storing our own version of crashes. Um, and that's because or we basically take a copy of what uh, we can get from the states and then store our own version. 
because from that version, we have a little bit more control over the, uh, the accuracy of the data. Um, sometimes it's what the police officer records um, isn't always completely accurate. Um, sometimes there's uh, sometimes they're inconsistent in how they fill out specific information. And so this gives us the flexibility to include or exclude crashes based on if we think they're relevant or not. Um, but probably more importantly, you know, this gives us a lot of flexibility over producing our system-wide crash rates. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're using these crash rates to and critical rates uh, to determine how safe or unsafe certain intersections are, or sections of roadways. Um, if there are updates that need to occur to um, two specific intersections, you know, what are areas are most dangerous for pedestrians or bicycles and what improvements can we make there, um, you know, all the way down to simple things like, you know, adding more signage to inform drivers that roundabout is approaching. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to have quick lookups if, uh, if our leadership or engineers need to know uh, what kind of crashes are occurring at a certain area in the last few years. Uh, we want to be able to provide a quick summary, either map-based or report-based of what's going on in that area and have it be specific to kind of our priorities. Also, it's also to do some uh, deeper analyses and I already, already mentioned the word reporting. You know, we have our own reports that we like to produce based on the crashes that are occurring um, on our county roads. So how are we actually, or what's the kind of the data flow uh, from the state to us? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, stored by the Department of Public Safety, um, but we actually get it get the data from MnDOT. Um, so MnDOT is able to uh, access the data and they've built their own kind of crash analysis system called MnCMAT2. Very helpful. Um, registered users can log in and explore reports, uh, crashes, and, um, do a lot of information gathering there. Uh, but we actually have enlisted our um, our IT staff to go into MinCMATS and pull out all of the crashes into our own SQL database. Where we can host them locally and make changes to them to the to these data locally. From the SQL database, we in transportation planning can then go and access it uh, via GIS, um, and then that's how we are able to. Uh, kind of get our hands on it and just play around with it and produce the reports that we need to produce. Um, ideally, we're hoping for a, a future solution where we can uh, essentially cut out the middleman of a uh, Neon SQL database and just um, or just access uh, these crash data from MinDOS portal. GIS portal into our GIS portal. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We just need some talks about how exactly we want to do that, but that's a future step that we hope to take. So uh, in addition to, so the crash data that we pull in is point-based. Uh, you can see the orange dots kind of on this image here are individual crashes that occurred. Um, on these sections of roadways in three years. But in addition to those crashes, we also need other information to produce our crash rates. Um, and those uh, those information are include uh, intersection attributes, and segment attributes. So one of the first things we really had to do when building this system uh, was kind of go back to the drawing board with our intersection inventories and our roadway inventories, and just making sure that it's accurate, it's up to date, and it has the attributes information that's relevant and necessary when 
when we're analyzing crashes and the safety of our roadways. Uh, so at the fundamental level for intersections, we simply need what type of intersection it is. And then we need the entering volume of, uh, of vehicles in that intersection. Uh, and we're also um, using intersection influence areas. So if you see the polygons there, um, if, a, if a car is rear-ended as it's approaching an intersection, more than likely, we're going to want to count that crash as a, an intersection-related crash. And so we want to make sure that spatially we're capturing crashes that might be occurring directly outside of the intersection. So that's why we produced uh, these intersection influence areas so that all the crashes that occur within them are tied to that intersection. Um, and similar to roadways, uh, we uh, need to know the roadway type, we need to know the traffic on that roadway, we need to know the length of, uh, of the segments that, uh, that we're uh, attaching these crashes to. And so this is why it's, you know, GIS works really well for this, of course, because you know, it's spatial data and we need to tie these crashes to intersections and roadways spatially. Um, so this is just an overview of kind of the entire process as it stands right now. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're pulling our the crash data from MinCMAT into our own SQL database. And then uh, in addition to the individual crash data, we need our intersections and segment inventories. Um, and another piece of information that we need, we need traffic counts. Um, and so all three of these pieces of data have um, the tendency, of course, to be updated um, pretty frequently. You know, roadway, roadways change and intersections are added. Um, traffic counts are usually updated every, at least every other year. And we get new crash data from MnDOT about once every three months. Uh, so because of this, we've built uh, a series of models within uh, ArcGIS Pro um, that helps us to update all of the information as it comes through. Um, you know, a lot of my colleagues refer to ArcGIS and Model Builder as kind of the black box because they just see what's going in and then they see the outputs um, and they don't necessarily see all of the, it's the GIS magic that's going on behind the scenes. So it's, referred to as the black box a little bit, but we have a, a series of models um, built that take in all of the data, um, different types of data, and refreshes kind of our, our reports and our output data. Um, and what we're doing at a fundamental level is producing crash rates for intersections and segments, but we're also producing critical rates, comparing similar intersections to each other um, and we're also producing summaries of and breakdowns of what types of crashes are occurring at each intersection what years of these crashes occurring and uh, similar summaries like that our end product then uh, we you know, we wanted this to be very accessible and interactive for our our leadership and other engineers that uh, need access to, to this information. So we've actually produced kind of two end products. Um, one is a RGS online operations dashboard. Um, and the other is a, a Power BI dashboard and a report builder. Um, and we have slightly different purposes for those two end products that I'll, I'll kind of go into detail in a little bit here. So the black box, as it's referred to by my colleagues, um, this is just an example of uh, one of the models, uh, I, I believe this one, 
takes uh, new crash data and summarizes it uh, at each intersection. So like I said, you know, intersections and segments, they're always being updated. New crashes are coming in. New traffic volumes are being reported. Um, so I believe we have five or six models that um, their purpose is just updating the outputs as new information comes in and summarizing them in, in ways that are helpful for us. All right, so this is one of the uh, kind of final deliverables. Um, a lot of us, I'm sure, recognize this as a, a, RJ, or a RGS Online dashboard. Um, and what we've actually done here is we produced a tab story map, and each tab is its own dashboard, and each dashboard has a slightly different theme and purpose. So this first one is um, crash based. It's, it's at the, the crash level. Uh, all the filtering is done on individual crashes. Um, and so you see uh, on the upper right hand corner there, probably one of the most important filters in this, in this dashboard is whether or not a crash occurs on the Henneman County system. Um, so we we pull in all the crashes that occur in Henry County, but and that's incredibly helpful to be able to report um, and and view. But a lot of times in public works, uh, especially in, when we're looking at uh, engineering projects and transportation projects, we're really only concerned with what we can control, and that's those are the crashes that occur on county roads or at county intersections. So that's probably one of the most important filters to just to be able to switch back and forth between everything that's going on in the county and then everything that's just on our county roads. Uh, one of the, um, and then the rest of this dashboard is essentially just being able to filter down to get the information that we want. And then we have these, three indicators that basically tell us uh, how many crashes in total are we looking at, and then how many fatal crashes there are, and how many serious injury crashes. Um, I did blur out those figures just because um, we're still in, in the process of QA, QC in some of this, and I don't wanna be sharing uh, figures that aren't completely accurate or, or could be misrepresented. Uh, this, yeah, this uh, this first tab, like I said, crash based, and basically just a lot of filters. Um, the bar charts at the bottom are the sort that you can click on, say 2018, and it filters down to just the 2018 crashes and, and so on. Uh, so I move over to, oh, and, and again, uh, I'm really unable to do a live demo for the same purpose I mentioned before. I don't want to be sh uh, sharing figures that aren't completely accurate um, or still have to be QA, QC. And so that's why I'm just sharing screenshots at the moment. Uh, but if we move on to the second tab here, now uh, this is a really good example of kind of the questions that we can answer um, with this system. Uh, so, here we were looking at the intersection level. So we're summarizing the charts and graphs at the intersection level. The filters are at the intersection level, so filtering on intersection attributes. Um, so this particular intersection is actually a roundabout in Champlain, I believe. And the actual crash rates and like number of crashes there, you know hasn't really been a, a cause for con concern. Um, nothing really stood out about it just from a, a factual standpoint. Um, but we did have a, a resident call in and say, uh, hey, cars keep crashing into my fence after going through this roundabout. Can you do something about this? So we go and we look at all the crashes that occurred here in the past three years and we see, well, there's six crashes. Um, 
and pretty much all of them are single vehicle run off the road crashes. Uh, so they're not running into each other, they're just going off the road. And um, another thing too is if you look at the hours that the crashes are occurring, um, all of the crashes have occurred when it's dark out, um, you know, between 9 p.m. and about 4 a.m. Uh, several of the crashes have occurred in the winter too. So it's very possible that you know, cars are flying down this road and they don't realize that there's a roundabout coming up until it's too late. That causes them to kind of, I'm sure we've all seen the videos of cars flying through roundabouts because they didn't see them there. So that way we can take that information and that feedback um, to our operations team and come up with a, a solution, whether that's lowering the speed limit, adding signage or adding, adding light um, to kind of make this section a little bit safer and more visible. Uh, the segments tab, again, very similar. We're just looking at specifically road segments and uh, the filtering is uh, all segment based. So what type of road we're looking at? Um, is it divided? Are there bike facilities or pedestrian facilities along it? Uh, I believe this particular section of road is in uh, Western Plymouth. Um, before I mentioned um, that, that we like to have control over the accuracy of the data. So another um, product that we've built is just a, an editing platform where we only a select few staff have access to it. Um, and essentially that's where we can go in and review crashes and change the information if needed. And it seems might seem a little sketchy that we're changing information, but um, what that actually refer what we're actually talking about is uh, if an officer uh, if a crash occurs in an, a parking lot or an alley, an officer might actually code that crash to the nearest roadway. Whereas we in our department, we're not necessarily concerned with crashes occurring in parking lots or alleyways, so we like. To have the ability to exclude those types of crashes from our from our engineering. Um, and before I mentioned uh, that we're also using Power BI um, as a way to produce alternate dashboards, and so this is where um, it's less of a lookup tool and more of a, a deep dive tool for our staff when they they really want to see a summary of crashes occurring at intersections. Um, basically, it's just a way to answer all the, the very specific questions that engineering staff might need might be asking um, rather than having all that functionality in uh, a web-based uh, dashboard. Uh, and Power BI has also given us a lot of really good opportunities to um, a lot of really good opportunities um, to produce the reports that we need to report or that we need to produce. Um, so Power BI has really been our friends um, as well as um, the operations dashboard in ArcGIS Online. So, and And um, that is really all I have. Um, I believe we can open it up to, to questions now if anyone has anything they'd like to, to ask. And I can't think of any questions, but I do thank you for your presentation today, Carl. It was it was pretty good. Thank you so much. Anybody else have anybody have any questions? Don't hesitate to speak up. Oh, 
Or Carl, you left him speechless. Well, all right. All right. On that one, then, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to our next presenters. All right, all right, all right. I had to unmute myself. That's my bad. Well, welcome. Um, thank you all for coming today. We appreciate your attendance. Um, my name is Savannah Grunsky, and I will be presenting with Matthew St. Ors. We are from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And today we are going to be talking about evaluating perceptions of cycling safety in Eau Claire. And this is a student faculty research project working in conjunction with uh, one of our geography professors. So looking through our agenda for the presentation today, we're going to start with some background and our motivation for researching this topic, as well as looking at some of our particular methods and going through um, a live survey example so you can see what the respondents were seeing as they went through the survey. Next, we will go through some of our results and analysis and do some discussion on those. And then we will talk about some of our challenges that we had while creating the survey and distributing it. And then we'll finish off with the conclusion and some of our future directions. So first off, we'll give you a little overview of our team. I'll let Matthew begin. Hello, hello. My name is Matthew St. Ors. Uh, my responsibility on this team was survey planning and recruitment. Did a few other things, but those were the primaries. Uh, I'm a senior. I'm studying transnational geography and sociology, and I'm primarily interested in human geography and social work. And like I said before, my name is Savannah Grunsky. I was also responsible for survey planning and recruitment. Um, I am a senior and I'm studying environmental geography with an economic minor. And I have interests in urban planning and sustainable development. We also had a third student named Nathan Walker. He was mostly responsible for survey recruitment and data visualization. He is also a senior at UWEC, studying geography and economics as well. And he has interests in GIS planning and land use and economic geographies. Then we have our professor, Matt Hafner, who acted as our research mentor. And he was in charge of survey planning and creation and recruitment. And he did the majority of our statistical testing. So now taking a look at why we wanted to study this topic. First off, bikeable communities have numerous benefits for citizens that I'm assuming you all are probably aware of, including health improvements, increased community interaction, and less impact on the environment. Um, but despite these benefits, however, there are considerable barriers to creating bike-friendly communities. And safety, or the lack thereof, is consistently identified as a major barrier to biking for potential cyclists, and it's also a significant concern for current cyclists. So as we looked at some other um, existing literature and research, we see that in Australia, the most commonly cited reason for low bicycle ridership is fear of collision with motorized vehicles. And we can see that trend in other literature as well. Similarly in Poland, um, study participants complain of a significant lack of cycling infrastructure, especially in the city center where it's most dangerous to cycle because of car density. And we also know distracted driving or drivers coming too fast or too fast strongly influences or causes worry in many potential and current cyclists, according to a study in San Francisco. Finland is also a popular place where cyclists thrive and the government has precautions in place to ensure that safe bicycling um, is safe for everyone and they bike all year round and they have similar winters as we do in the Midwest and their government encourages Finns to cycle and not drive to reduce carbon footprint, which we hope to see more of. So in line with this previous research, we seek to evaluate the residents' perception of safety in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but with specific focus on where and why these concerns exist. So as for our methods in running this survey and doing the data analysis, 
we had to create a survey. And so we used our project for statistical computing, the package Shiny. Um, and for our data handling, we used the SF package. We used the leaflet for web mapping, ggplot2 for visualization. And to ensure the most amount of access for everybody, including cyclists, we created the survey to work mobily and on desktop. Um, and on the right of our screen here, you can see a flyer that we created. Um, and it kind of just has a little QR code that you can scan on your phone. And some of our other flyers just had uh, links to the website. Um, but for the implementation, we use those flyers um, with the QR codes and the links. And we place them primarily near our campus in downtown Eau Claire. Um, anywhere really where there was, uh, was a large population of people and see that uh, saw a lot of biking flow. Um, and we advertised these flyers to other students and local community groups online through like Facebook groups or or through other uh, we use like the geography department account. Um, a survey was hosted on shinyapps.io and our data was stored on AWS S3. As for our analysis, we did some data visualization, some spatial analysis, specifically web mapping and kernel density. And the, st and the analysis that we did was statistical testing for differences by gender. And all of these were done in R. And on this screen, you can see our survey. And this screen that pops up initially, note instructions can be toggled on and off with the menu button on the upper left, this little icon. Uh, we included this primarily for mobile users as when you logged on and scanned the QR code, all you would see was the map. You didn't see any instructions and the instructions are important. Uh, firstly, we select the locations which you feel are notably unsafe for cycling near routes where you ride in Eau Claire. Start by clicking on this icon just below the zoom control map. Then click on the map to place a marker. You'll notice a checklist appears below the map. Select a reason for why that location is unsafe. So to begin, I'm going to click, take this marker. Um, I know that this intersection I've always felt a little weird about. I'll map that one. And I'll scroll down here. And these are the reasons why we feel unsafe. Uh, just a, a pretty short list of them. But in this location specifically, I'd probably say volume and proximity to traffic. And then repeat for as many locations as you feel are necessary. For the sake of time, I'll, I'll just stick with one. Uh, then click the neighborhood tab and select the square which corresponds to your approximate home location. Uh, we did this mainly to just see if we had like a really large population of responses in this area. We'd like to know where those people live because assuming that all those people lived in that area and responded, we can't really judge a whole lot on other areas. Um, and lastly, to complete the survey, click on the questions tab and select your responses there. When you are finished, click on the submit response button below the final question. So I'll go through these questions real quick. Uh, how confident do you feel in your cycling ability? Seven, very confident. One is not confident. Uh, oh, how does cycling influence where you ride? Assume seven is very much and one not at all. Safety. Uh, approximately how many trips do you take by bike per week? We have a few options here. How often do you wear a helmet when riding a bike? always. Uh, for what reasons do you ride a bike? Select all that apply, all that apply. What is your age? And what is your race and gender? Perfect. And then submit response. And this is all the data that we gathered from our survey. So here you can see this is an actual sample of our data responses. Um, and so as we can look over here, we have the confidence levels from one to seven. We have safety influence from one to seven as well. Then we have our number of trips per week. We have our helmet usage, age, gender. This is the neighborhood ID block um, where people reside in. We also have our race category, which is um, collected with a dummy variable using zeros and ones. And then you can see we have our reasons for cycling here. We have recreation, exercise, and transportation. And as you can see, a lot of people chose all three because they use all, all three of those reasons. 
Then over here we have device type, so we can note whether they took the survey on mobile or desktop. And then we can also see the browser type, we can see the OS, and then we can see our browser width and height, which can play a role in the responses because um, if the, the width is really small, we can tell they likely did it on mobile and that could have impacted whether they um, plotted spatial data on the map because of what Matthew said. If they opened it up on um, mobile, they might not have seen the instructions and didn't know what to do with the map. So this is just kind of giving you an idea of some of the responses that we've received. I can click this here and you can get kind of a shuffle of what we have. Uh, you can see like right here, we have quite a few responses with pretty low confidence. Um, if I try this, we can see here's another um, group of people with safety not really influencing where they ride. Um, but that's just a nice idea of what some of our responses look like. So this is actual data that we've collected. And this is a heat map of all of our spatial data of where people responded. They felt unsafe cycling in Eau Claire. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Eau Claire, I guess, in the general layout, um, this this is the main square that I selected on the, on the second tab there. Um, primarily, we have campus down here uh, where we are currently. And then we have downtown over in this area. And this is our Water Street where all of our bars and we have a couple stores down there as well. Um, but it seems to be primarily populated around downtown campus and on Water Street, um, as you can see here. And we have the Chippewa River running through our campus. And as you can see here, the bridges are notably causes for concern. And these are actually two of like the four bridges that we have. Um, and the other two are pedestrian bridges and there are no responses on those. Except there is one on this one over here. This is the one going through campus. Um, but yes, uh, primarily bridges and really densely populated roads like our Water Street here, State Street, and then our downtown area in general seem to be large causes of concern. And most of the responses seem to be located in places of intersections, similar to what Carl was talking about earlier. So next we can look at this map, um, which is similar to the one before, but it's divided by gender. So we can see the females in purple and the male in green. Um, so if I zoom out a little bit, you can kind of see that the male responses um, disperse a little bit further than the female responses. Um, but there's no way to know that all of these points could, could have been one person or multiple people. Um, it's difficult to know. So it's kind of hard to make conclusions based on this um, visualization. But we still can confirm that most of this Water Street common area in the downtown CBD district um, are densely populated and seem to be the large culprit of feeling unsafe, um, as well as some of these bridges here. Awesome. In this graph, we're comparing our helmet usage by gender, and it seems like there's not a whole lot of variability between gender on the always and sometimes variables, but as for never wearing a helmet, we have significantly more males who are never willing to wear a helmet compared to females. And as for this one, we're comparing helmet usage and age uh, percentage. And as we can see, we have a lot more responses uh, with college age students from 18 to 24. Um, that was pretty expected for us. Um, and the fact that the majority of them never wear helmets um, and same with the 25 through 34 is definitely notable and definitely something for us to think about in future data. So looking at some of our statistical testing, uh, we started off by doing some two group T tests. Um, this first one was by confidence and gender. So we can see the male in blue and the female in pink. And as you look, you can tell that the males seem to fall a lot higher on the spectrum, which means they feel more confident cycling whereas the females um, fall a little bit shorter on here. 
And if we look at the actual test, this is um, the test that we ran in our markdown. Um, but here we can look at the p-value particularly. Um, it falls at a 0 0.04, which means that it is statistically significant at a 95% uh, confidence interval. Then next, we also did another similar statistical test um, using a two-group t-test again, um, looking at the influence of safety by gender. So here again, you can see the females in pink and the males in blue. And uh, it looks like that females fall a lot higher on this spectrum, meaning that they are influenced more by feeling safe on their cycling routes compared to males. So looking at this test again, uh, we can see the p-value at 0 0.002, which means it's even more um, statistically significant than the previous test. Um, but we were kind of hoping that some of these p-values would be different um, or maybe not statistically significant, saying that there wasn't a difference in gender, but it looks like what we have found um, aligns with previous research. And as for some challenges that we ran into along the way, um, our first biggest challenge was making it mobile. Um, we decided early on that just having a survey that was only available on desktop would probably not be the best idea for accessibility for cyclists. Um, especially since we decided to go with posters and QR codes. Most people who are cycling aren't going to want to whip out a laptop and aren't carrying a laptop to be able to take it that way. So we had to create the app so it was able to run on mobile and on desktop. desktop. Uh, as for flyer distribution, uh, we had a low response rate in participant recruitment. And for our response data, we had a lack of spatial data due to incomplete responses, which mostly came from uh, mobile users who just didn't read the instructions or didn't have a good understanding of what to do, and high demographic bias relative to actual population of Eau Claire. And to conclude, there are significant dif uh, differences in cycling confidence and the influence of feeling safe by gender in Eau Claire. Our results generally align with previous research done, although we expected somewhat different results with an anticipated gender bias. Because of our survey collection method, race and age were not as variable as we hope to reflect the actual survey population. Uh, intersections and bridges appear to be the largest culprits of cyclists feeling unsafe, especially in Eau Claire, and the data allows us to return with more spatial analysis in the future. We are currently in, still in the process of writing a research paper on this topic, which will hopefully be published. And then some of our future directions. Um, we hope to um, better tie the spatial responses to land uses um, and other spatial variables, as well as making it replicable in other cities of a similar size. We'd also like to um, give out a thanks to the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, the ORSP, for funding our research. Um, in addition to the community and local businesses for participating and um, spreading the word of our survey. So now we'll just ask for some questions. Again, thank you for attending our presentation and let us know if you have any questions. Hi, this is uh, Carl. I just wanted to say um really good presentation uh i was also want to say i actually was excited when i saw the topic because um i lived in eau claire for a few years and my parents still live there and i went to school at uw eau claire so i'm very familiar with the area and um, i've enjoyed biking around there hey that's um, awesome to hear carl yeah yeah absolutely and i've i'm happy to see every time i go back to eau claire and i feel like i see one or two uh improvements in the bicycle infrastructure when I when I drive around town. But I just wanted to ask if you have any plans to uh, share this research with um, the local government, like either the city of Eau Claire or the county of Eau Claire. Yeah, so we actually have another comment in the comment section asking the same thing. Um, I think more long term down the road, we hope to um, once we get some more spatial analysis going on. Um, and I think we would like to present it to the city council or um, the Department of Transportation here um, just to give them some idea where we need more improvements in the infrastructure. 
Um, but that's a more of a down, down the road, long-term kind of thing. Um, maybe even making it replicable in another city first so we can kind of test it out and see how it works for other people. But I think down the road, that's definitely a long-term goal of ours. Cool. Do we have any other questions? Okay, we have a question in the chat here. Uh, Rick says, does the influence of bike paths on city streets play into the analysis? Does Eau Claire have specific locations on city streets for bikers specifically? Take yeah, one? so we do have a few, of, uh, well, on the, uh, on the few bigger roads and busier roads, there's some designated bike lanes, um, but there are a bunch of problems with some of them, like some of them weave through the middle of the street in between the, at like an intersection, you're going straight or you're taking a right. It's in between that lane and that is one of the hottest spots for our uh, responses. Um, so there are uh, there are paths and, and bike lanes, but we think that, and according to our uh, responses, they can be done better. Um, and they're definitely one of the causes of concern for a lot of cyclists here. But we do have a lot of like off trail um, cycling lanes from old railroad railroads. Um, a lot of people like to bike on those Although there still is some concern even on bike trails for um, interaction with pedestrians as well, because mm -hmm. that is one of our um, responses on the survey. If that's a large concern for people, they could choose that for the intersection points that they've plotted. And we did see some of those on one of the pedestrian bridges. There was a response um, with concern to um, interaction with pedestrians. So that's another area of concern as well. Yeah. We have any more questions? I will say that as an avid bicyclist myself, uh, your research is something that I feel strongly needs to be done in a lot of municipalities. And I hope yeah. that it's picked up by other places as well. Yes, I also agree. Um, oh, we have another comment. So Rick says, I saw you used R for analysis. Do you like to use R? I took the class from Matt H yesterday. So interested, yes. Um, for the most part, I think it's relatively easy. Um, like as Matt usually says, the learning curve is rather shallow. Um, so it's pretty easy to learn off the bat, but it can get pretty complex pretty quickly. So, I mean, Thankfully, um, I am not very well versed in it. So since Matt did most of our um, statistical analysis and things like that, it was helpful that I didn't have to do it particularly because I do struggle with it. Um, but I think it is a very beneficial tool, especially for data analysis like this. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely something that is good to learn. Like we did this, we ran this presentation through our markdown. Um, and it went really well. This is that like one of the best presentation layouts that I've used compared to like PowerPoint or Google Slides or something like that. So I, yeah, I definitely like it. It's definitely worth the effort of learning. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you all again for joining. We were, um, very honored to present at this conference this year. It was a good experience for us. So thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Matthew, Savannah, Carl, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for everything that you presented to us. It has been very important and very educational. Thank you. If anybody would like to see these uh, recordings, then do not hesitate to request them from the uh, conference committee. I'm not sure when they're gonna be available, but they will be. If anyone has any questions of me, I will be here for just a couple moments more, but otherwise, thank y'all for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>